Infrastructure with SALT Remote Execution Modules session. Thank you for coming. I am Wes Novak, and I have my colleague Theodore Cowan with me. We work at Pluralsight. We do DevOps, SysOps, CloudOps, lots of other things related to those things at Pluralsight. Um, we have a heterogeneous infrastructure comprised of many different uh, flavors of Linux and Windows. So we have a bit of variety in our uh, infrastructure there. Um, we are primarily AWS. We have approximately 800 EC2 instances uh, on our AWS uh, private cloud in VPCs. And we use uh, SaltStack as our primary uh, configuration management and remote execution platform. So um, we are going to go through a lot of material um, in this presentation, lots of uh, commands and command line stuff, and a demo. And at the end, um, we're, I'm going to have a link to download the presentation and a GitHub link to our demo. Um, so don't worry about trying to you know, take notes on everything. Um, it's all going to be available afterwards. So um, we're going to save all the questions for the end as well. So please uh, hold off on those until we get to the Q&A section. And uh, to start, I'm going to hand it over to my co-presenter, Theo. All right, thanks, Wes. Everybody can hear me? This is going to be nice and distracting, the two presenters. But this is how you get uh, two free tickets to SaltConf for one presentation. So, um, so we're going to go over the basics to begin with. Um, this is a talk about remote execution, one of the most basic and fundamental and most popular parts of Salt. Uh, we're going to start with the master minion relationship. Everybody should pretty much know this by now, but we're going to just go over it real quick. How does the master minion relationship work? Minions first make a socket connection to the master. Some keys are exchanged for authentication and encryption. The master accepts the minion key, and then the master is ready to control the minion. The uh, master trusts the minion because the master actually accepts the minion keys, and the uh, minion trusts the master because the minion's the one who called the master. You know, it's sort of a you called me scenario. So remote execution is basically when uh, the master is sending commands down to the minion. If you're doing something like a ID match or a list match, and we're going to go more into matches later, um, you'll get a target list that's very specific and only those uh, minions will be targeted. If you're doing like a generic grain match, uh, basically all of the minions are targeted and then the minion itself actually determines if it's a, a valid target and will return to the master um, and run the command uh, if it's um, supposed to. So we're going to be talking about modules and their functions. Again, very basics here. What is a module? So a module is in the in a salt command right here, salt, target everything, test.ping. Test is the module, and it is actually a Python module. Um, if, you, if you look inside, you can find all the modules inside of user layer Python 2.7 site packages, salt modules. Um, or if that's the version of Python you're running salt with. You can also put your modules in an underscore modules directory in any of your file servers registered to salt. The ping part here is the actual function, and it is a Python function inside of the test module. Um, and here's the exact code uh, for the ping function. Um, as you can see, I can't actually see it very well on my screen, but uh, it's actually doing a little bit more than you'd expect. I thought that it would just return true, but it's, it's doing some sort of check to make sure it's not something and then returning. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Wes. Thanks, Theo. Um, so again, we're gonna start with, uh, still keep going with the basics here. There are four foundations of SALT, remote execution, configuration management and orchestration, event-driven inf infrastructure, cloud management. We're talking about remote execution, which allows you to uh, command and control your fleet. Um, so at Pluralsight, um, even if we have some kind of a snowflake host that uh, we uh, aren't going to config manage, which we do want to config manage everything, but you know, once in a while there's some kind of uh, emergency like give me this host for something and I'm just going to manually put all this stuff on it. Uh, we still want to salt it because we want to have that uh, view and remote execution across our entire fleet of hosts so that we can do things later like you know, patch a security vulnerability or uh, you know, check all of our servers in our entire fleet, make sure that they have the correct NTP server settings or name server settings or that there wasn't a, you know, sometimes maybe somebody leaves and we just do a quick check on all of, uh, all of the hosts across the entire fleet, make sure there wasn't some local account for that person or something like that. Uh, so quickly going to go over targeting. This is pretty basics for everybody. Uh, we got uh, salts targeting by the minion ID. That's the most basic version. 
And again, um, you can also target by grain. There's a big difference here between uh, how these uh, commands are sent to the minions. If you're targeting by ID, um, the salt master uh, it actually evaluates the, the specific minions that it needs to send that to. So that can be a lot faster than grain targeting because when you do a grain target, again, it sprays that uh, command out to the entire fleet of minions and then it's waiting for all of those minions to, to talk back to the master to say like, oh yeah, I, I matched that grain target. Um, so that can be prob problematic, especially if you have uh, a host that's not responding um, for some reason, uh, your, your minion goes unresponsive, then even if you're targeting another set of minions with a, a different grain, since the master is waiting for that uh, you know, entire fleet of minions to respond back and the one minion is non-responsive, you can get a really long running command there and uh, it'll take a, a while for your salt command to return and it'll have one of these minions say, you know, non-responsive minion, even though you weren't even trying to target that one. So uh, that is one problem with grain matching that you can avoid by using uh, ID matching or list matching. Um, you can do compound matching um, using multiple uh, types of targeting. And here I'm just doing two grain targets on uh, the grain uh, rolls. Again, looking for the value app one or app two. We use uh, the rolls grain extensively at Pluralsight to help us uh, categorize and identify hosts. Um, that's a mandatory uh, grain. Um, so if you, you know, come upon a host, you don't know what it does, you can just grains.get, check out the rolls, give you an idea of what the purpose of that host is. Uh, you can target by list, common delimited, uh, list of minion IDs. Uh, you can target by a discrete IP address, which can be useful at times, or even a CIDR range if you want to target all of the minions in a particular subnet. Use the dash S option there. And you can also target by pillar key and pillar value. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the built-in execution modules that are part of Salt Core. Um, typically, when you spin up a minion, you're going to have over 100 uh, built-in execution modules available. Uh, it varies by platform, it varies by what's installed. Um, I think I heard in a previous talk there are close to 500 execution modules currently uh, built into Salt Core. Um, hundreds of module functions, and many can be used across OS platforms. So it provides this abstraction layer for you if you want to be able to do uh, you know, common tasks across uh, different types of hosts running different OSs, Windows, Linux, different, different versions of Linux, Unix. Um, if you get to know the Salt execution modules, you may only just have to remember those execution module commands versus the you know, discrete commands that would do the equivalence on each of those different OSs. So that's, that's uh, advantageous there. Uh, first module I want to talk about is the sysmod module. Um, this uh, allows you to list all the modules available on a target minion. Um, that'll tell you what's available, what you can uh, call as an execution module on a particular minion. Um, the sys.doc uh, function gives you the documentation on a module or a uh, function uh, within a module. So that can give you an idea of how to use the module, um, what functions are available within a module, things like that. The sys.argspec uh, function allows you to uh, check out what arguments are uh, required and available for a particular function in another execution module. And uh, here's a just quick screenshot of the sys.doc in action here. I'm, I'm querying a web one minion here, checking out the file.search uh, function, and it tells you what's available there and what parameters you might uh, be able to give it, gives you an example. So use sys.doc, it's very helpful. The network module, this is one I use very frequently um, to verify network access, uh, make sure that uh, security group rules, were, again, we're AWS, so we all, security groups are our primary firewalls. Um, verify that access is indeed open between a minion and another location. Um, you specify the IP or the DNS and then the port you're trying to query. Um, Network.IP adders returns a list of the IP addresses assigned to a minion. Uh, Network.active underscore TCP gives you all the active TCP connections on a minion, helpful for troublesho troubleshooting. Uh, Network.dig, as you might expect, is just like the uh, GNU dig. And here's a quick example of two of the Network.connect uh, execution module calls against a minion. Uh, you can see on the top one, it was unable to connect. On the bottom one, it was able to connect, so it returned a true. The HTTP module. Um, this one allows you to query any arbitrary HTTP or HTTPS uh, URL and get a return. Um, if it is able to query that uh, endpoint, it will return the body. Um, so we use this uh, pretty extensively as well, even in deployment states. Uh, as a validation step, um, so that uh, after we deploy a web application, we'll 
you know, query the health check on that web application to make sure that that application came up successfully. And then if it didn't, you know, we can fail out of that uh, deployment state in various ways. Um, this is another one, uh, part of the HTTP module. It's wait for successful query. So if you know that there's a particular uh, endpoint that is going to be coming up, but it's not up yet, you can shoot this, uh, fire off this uh, function to your minion, and then it will return once that endpoint is available. So if you're working on bringing a site up or a particular endpoint up, and you, know, you wanna know when it's available to the minion, you can use that. And the uh, wait for parameter there gives you the uh, number of seconds to wait, and the default is uh, five minutes, 300 seconds. Uh, here's a quick uh, screenshot of HTTP.query, querying localhost. You can see the body is returned on the uh, default Nginx page there that I had on that minion. Service module. So this one, uh, as you might expect, is super useful for checking the status on a service across uh, Linux and Windows hosts. You can do a reload of a service. You can do a restart of a service. You can use get underscore all function to list all the services available on a particular minion target. And here's a screenshot of the get all output. Show all the services running on my web one minion here. The salt util module. So I wanted to mention this one uh, particularly because of the pillar underscore refresh uh, function. Um, typically the way the pillar data works on a minion is that when you run a state.apply or state.sls, before that's run, the minion refreshes its pillar data from the master. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work. So in particular, uh, I, I recall uh, salt version 2016.11.3 did not do this automatically like it was supposed to. So when we were running that version of salt, we had to refresh our pillar data every time before we ran a state because it wasn't automatically getting refreshed as it should. So that's a good one to know. Uh, Saltutil.running tells you about the uh, salt jobs that are currently running on that minion. You can terminate all jobs with term underscore all underscore jobs. You can kill all jobs. And here is a quick uh, screenshot of saltutil.running. It shows the job and the JID that's running here. Um, this was the wait for successful query uh, function that I demoed previously. It shows that it's currently running on the minion waiting for that uh, endpoint to become available. The file module, um, file.grep is awesome. Works just like GNU grep. Um, it'll return the actual uh, output of the file that you're searching or path that you're searching and show you, you know, where it matched. It doesn't work on Windows. Um, so for Windows, you gotta use file.search and that just returns a true or a false. And file.disk usage, check a path. File.find. And here's a quick, uh, oh, another uh, function that I like to use, file.replace. That's super handy for quickly replacing some pattern that you're trying to replace in a particular text file. So in this example, you can see I was uh, targeting the Nginx configuration file, um, looking for the pattern bad JSON, and then replaced it with uh, Hashtag bad JSON, whatever you want to call that symbol. Publish module, okay, so this is uh, another interesting uh, remote execution uh, functionality within Salt that a lot of people probably aren't aware of. So um, Salt has this concept of peer publishing that allows you to enable the ability for one minion to remotely execute commands on another minion through the master. So as you might expect, that could be a security risk. So please know what you're doing before enabling this. Um, it uses regex and this peer configuration setting here in the salt masters uh, configuration file. And if you wanna open it up for all your minions to execute all functions against all other minions, you can do that, but I don't recommend it. Um, the better way to do it is to specify which minions are even allowed to do peer publishing, which you do with this second level uh, key here under peer. And uh, in this case, I'm specifying all minions named web something are gonna be able to do peer publishing. And then there's another sub key here that you can, the documentation says you're, you can limit the minions that are doing the peer publishing, you can limit which minions they can target with this one. So in this case of the config, I'm trying to uh, enable all web something minion IDs to publish only to the minion IDs of HA proxy something, and then I'm only allowing them to run the module HA proxy and all functions. So you can, you can do some limiting there. Unfortunately, in 2016.11 um, versions, this part doesn't work. 
Um, so there's some kind of salt bug there. Um, I need to file a bug report, but um, whenever I tried to do this with 2016 and 11, it didn't work, so I had to take this out, uh, removing the limit on which, uh, uh, which uh, minions the peer publishing minions could target. Um, but if you are gonna use this, again, essentially you're giving root access to your entire fleet if you don't lock it down, so be careful with it. Um, or maybe consider using a reactor or something of that sort instead of doing something like this. But it is available, and I'll give you a quick demo here on the next screen. Um, oh, here's one of the published commands, just to give you an example. So here, I'm uh, executing against the uh, ID uh, of the minion web one, publish.publish. .publish. I'm gonna target the minion HA proxy one. I'm gonna use the module HA proxy, the function disable server, and a couple of arguments. So next slide is a quick demo of how the peer publishing works. So first I'm just gonna do a test.ping to show you what minions we have attached to this master. Uh, you can see we've got a couple of web minions and then HA, a couple of HA proxy minions. Next I'm gonna do some peer publishing using the publish.publish. .publish. I'm gonna target HA proxy one as the uh, other minion that I'm gonna publish to. I'm gonna do a service.restart, HA proxy, and at the time I had the service module uh, whitelisted in my peer config, and you can see that I got a response back from that HA proxy one minion of true that I was able to restart that HA proxy service. So what happened here again was the web one minion did a publish.publish, .publish, which, which went through the master. The master said, is this minion allowed to do peer publishing? Yes, it is. Uh, is, this, is this minion allowed to do peer publishing to its target that is calling? Yes, it is. Is it allowed to do a, uh, this module and this function? Yes, it is. So I'm gonna send that command to that other minion. That other minion did what it was told sent the status back to the salt master, then the salt master fed it back to this minion to tell it that it was successful. Salt CMD mod module. So this is the, uh, obviously the most powerful module uh, with salt, allows you to basically do anything, arbitrary commands and shell execution. Um, CMD.run to run any shell command on your target minions. Um, doing an echo here in this example. Um, you can do CMD exec underscore code to specify what you want to execute. Um, here, uh, the example is I'm telling it to execute Python 3 and giving it some Python 3 code to say hello, saltconf. Um, CMD dot has underscore exec will tell you if an exec executable name exists on the minion that you're querying. Uh, CMD dot which works just like GNU which. And CMD dot script. Uh, CMD dot script is really nice and useful and powerful because it allows you to store scripts on your salt master that you could execute against any minions attached to that master. You don't have to copy the script to your minions. You just tell it the file path to the script within your file server root here, and then uh, it just executes that script against whatever minions you target. So if you have some really long scripts or uh, you, know, you have some scripts that you're commonly executing against many different uh, minions, you can stick it somewhere in your uh, file server root and then call it through this uh, salt URL, and you don't have to worry about copying it to all of your different minions. A uh, couple cmd.run examples, um, just kind of few that I just tossed on the slide here. Top one is a Redis CLI command. I'm calling the minion named ID, um, giving it a Redis CLI command to uh, check the client list connected to the Redis instance, and then uh, grep out the uh, IP addresses, sort it, and then give me the, the top connection. So if there's a particular host that's connecting 500 times to my Redis instance, then I can see the, the top offender there. Uh, the middle one here for Rabbit is doing something similar. I'm sorting connections by user, and then uh, you know sorting it again, telling me who the uh, offender might be that is opening up 1,000 connections to my Rabbit host or cluster. And then the bottom one here, uh, I'm targeting uh, ID again, and uh, oh, I think I have a typo on that slide. Yeah, you can uh, ignore that part. Uh, cmd.run, um, and in this example, I've got the uh, shell parameter at the end of the cmd.run, and this, uh, I just wanted to illustrate that you can you know, uh, specify any shell you want when you're doing cmd.run. So if you didn't want to use the default shell on your uh, instance that you're targeting, you can specify another one. Uh, here's a quick screenshot of one of the scripts that uh, I use pretty frequently for uh, checking uh, for unsynced uh, Rabbit high availability queues on my Rabbit cluster. Um, so we use HA queues, which means a copy of the message gets uh, replicated to every node in our Rabbit cluster. 
and sometimes they can go out of sync for various reasons. And if they're out of sync, you need to sync them, because Rabbit won't do that automatically. And uh, this, this script will detect all of those unsynced cues and uh, sync them up. So um, here's the example down here of the command that I would use to uh, sync cues across all of my Rabbit cluster nodes. Uh, here's another uh, example of a cmd.script that I have for uh, Windows 2012 hosts, and this uh, downloads a, uh, a PowerShell module from uh, the TechNet gallery, and then allows me to do a Windows update and reboot. So if I want to patch a Windows host really quick, I can do it with this, with this uh, script stored on my salt master. And this is bad. Ignore that. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to go over a couple tips and tricks next. Subset batch size and fail hard. So subset uh, parameter of the salt CLI. This is super useful if you want to, uh, for example, check a configuration file on a cluster of nodes. You don't really uh, need every single node to tell you what's going on there, right? Because your hosts are config managed. They should all be the same. So generally, you only need one or maybe a couple of those hosts to tell you what's going on there. Um, so you can use the subset option. Um, to uh, limit that return uh, to just come from one of the minions so that you don't have to get the return from you know, all 10 nodes in your 10 node cluster. So I use subset pretty frequently. Um, batch size I use very frequently as well. Um, this uh, basically executes your salt command in a batching fashion, uh, one host at a time, so that they're not uh, executing the same command uh, at the same time, which is the typical behavior. So in, uh, in this example here, if I had you know, four minions that had the roles web grain on them, and I did a service.restart of Nginx on them, and I didn't have the batch size on them, that service would restart all, all at the same time on all of those hosts, and then maybe you'd have an outage or something. So uh, you can use batch size to limit um, the scope of your commands from happening all at the same time. And then batch size is particularly handy uh, when used in conjunction with fail hard. So uh, when you're doing a batch operation, um, again, you're executing that command on one minion at a time, uh, or you know maybe two minions at a time, or 50% or something like that. You can also specify percentages. Um, but when you're doing that batch operation, sometimes, uh, as, for example, as part of a deploy, um, maybe you're doing a deploy and uh, the deploy is bad, and you don't want that deploy to go out to all hosts if it's going to be bad. So if you use fail hard with batch size, if you're uh, if one or more of those uh, batch uh, batches within your batch operation fails, it'll halt the entire batch operation. And so those remaining batches will never execute the command that you first started. So if you're doing a deploy and it goes to the first host and that brings your host down, uh, that bat batch operation will be aborted and then maybe you can uh, prevent downtime for that particular cluster or application. Uh, next up, I'm gonna show a quick uh, example of the batch size and fail hard. A uh, quick demo, just to show you a little bit what that looks like on the CLI. Um, here I'm targeting the uh, roles web again, doing a test.pig just to show you, test.ping, show you all the hosts that are gonna respond there, minions that are gonna respond. Uh, you see we had web one through six minions there. I'm using batch size of one, I'm using fail hard. I'm gonna target that roles web grain again, do a service.reload of nginx, and let's see what happens. So you see it's a batch operation, it went to Minion five first, web five, then it went to minion web four, then it went to minion web six, and then on minion web six, something happened. It was, it was a, a fail. The uh, operation did not complete successfully, and then it, it aborted the batch operation. So minions one, two, and three that were matched as part of that green match never got that command. Salt uh, aborted that batch operation. Uh, discover minions, so um, you can also uh, use things like uh, test.ping with a grep to discover uh, minions that respond uh, using like a Perl compatible regex, and I, I use this sometimes for some things to, uh, to discover uh, minions um, within a shell script. Um, this can be problematic though, because again, when you're targeting, uh, using a grain targeting, if you have uh, any minion in your fleet that is uh, not responding or has high CPU and the salt minion is unable to respond, then that's gonna hang. So you, you can use this, but it's probably better to use something like the salt cache, but that, that requires a little bit more uh, uh, parsing out of things. Um, so up here in the top again, I put uh, all of the servers that are uh, included. The current servers that have this rolls app one grain would get stuck into this uh, bash array here, and then I loop through the uh, array 
on the next line here, and then I do a service restart of Apache. So just a quick example of like one thing you can do there with uh, uh, the CLI and in conjunction with Bash. Um, another very similar thing that I've, I have had to do is discover bad minions and then recycle those minions. So uh, I'm not exactly sure what has caused this in the past, but uh, once in a while we get into the state where we've got minions that will respond to ID targeting, but they won't respond to grain targeting. Um, I know one time this happened when someone on my team accidentally deleted all of the minion keys from the master, so that was a good time, and uh, had a bunch of non-responsive minions. Uh, we've had it had a, happen at least one other time for reasons I'm not clear, but um, this script allowed me to uh, discover all of those minions that were returning with minion did not, or, or that Salt saw as not returning, um, because this gets output on the CLI, and then I looped through all of those minions and restarted the salt minion, and then everybody was happy again and everything was good. So that has been useful for us for a few times. Uh, this is also uh, kind of cool, something I've done with uh, Ubuntu hosts and uh, accidentally upgraded the salt minion maybe on a host, and then you have to reinstall salt on uh, you know, maybe a prior version. So you can actually use salt to uninstall salt and then reinstall salt using salt. So kind of fun. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Theo, who's gonna talk about uh, the Salt API. All right, that was a lot of information, but it was really good <laughs> stuff. Um, so for everybody who said to themselves, oh, I already knew all that stuff, uh, this next section is for you. Uh, we tried to create something that was totally new, and uh, we did. So first, a little intro to the Salt API. For those who don't know, the Salt API is a not really restful, but HTTP API that allows you access to the Salt Master, and it basically is what allows you to integrate your salt into a lot of other things. You might have Team City or Jenkins, and maybe a deploy process that needs to go and run a salt command. Maybe you're running Nagios, and you can set up a webhook that goes and when an alert happens, instead of um, alerting a person, maybe alert a person and fix the problem with the salt command if you know what command you need to run. Um, and there's API implementations in Team City, Jenkins, Rundeck, and, and now um, CloudFormation, which is what I'm going to show you today. So. Um, who here is familiar with CloudFormation from AWS? Who uses it? Okay, a few people. Um, and who's, of those people, who's familiar with custom resources? Ha ha, so no one's, no one's seen this yet, so that's good. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to basically, with CloudFormation, CloudFormation allows you to express your infrastructure as code, just like you might express your platform configuration as code uh, with SaltStack. Um, very useful. So uh, with CloudFormation custom resources, um, you know, with a CloudFormation script, you might say something like, let's spin up an EC2 instance, let's spin up an RDS instance, let's set the user data with some information to bootstrap it with salt and stuff like that. But sometimes it'd be really nice to be able to, within that same document, say, I'd like to also do this one thing in salt. Because there's something that salt needs to create as, far, as part of this process. And you can accomplish this with custom resources. So, what the custom resource will do is the CloudFormation script will run. Um, it will basically run a Lambda function. That line of function will call the Salt API. The Salt API will return the results of the Lambda function. The Lambda function drops the results into a pre-signed um, S3 URL, and then that gets sucked back into CloudFormation for its own um, responses. So let me go back and actually show you how this works. I have to just change my display first. Demo time. That's right. Cool. Still working. Okay, so the, pro the project that we're going to use for this is a project that we wrote called SaltStack's CloudFormation Lambda, and this is free and open source. Everybody can go use this, and we're going to deploy this using the exact instructions from the readme document here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is actually build and deploy the Lambda function. I'm doing it this way so I can show you all that it's quite easy to set up. Okay. Whew, oh, that's really bad. I'm just gonna zoom in a ton. So I don't know how to change my color that quick. <laughs> All right.
So there I just use a, a convenient packaging command that uh, CloudFormation gives you. Now I'm actually um, deploying the Lambda function. And I'm doing this separate from the CloudFormation script that's actually going to be calling salt, but you could actually do this all within one script. And the thing that I'm gonna change is HAProxy. So I have an HAProxy instance here. Uh, we're going to imagine that I need to spin up an EC2 instance, and I also want to create a HAProxy backend, and I want to put that instance in that backend in one process. So there's HAProxy, you can see right there, it has a static one backend in there currently. And while that spins up, I'll show you the uh, CloudFormation script I'm going to deploy here. Okay, hopefully that's readable. So here is the resource of an AWS EC2 instance. And here's my custom resource. The way you define a custom resource in AWS is the type is custom, and then you can give it a custom name. And then the only required parameter is this service token. And this service token is basically gonna be an imported value from the Lambda function I just deployed. And then all this are, all these parameters are gonna be passed to my Lambda function, which is basically a client for the Salt API. And if, you've, if anybody here has used the, uh, like the Jenkins plugin for TeamCity, all these parameters will look familiar. They're basically all the parameters you need to send a Salt command. All right, my Lambda function's created. And now I'm gonna deploy, I'm gonna run that uh, CloudFormation script I just showed you. So if we go back into here, this will take a, take a second, but right now what's happening is the EC2 instance is being created. Um, the EC2 instance needs to be created and I need to get an, uh, an internal IP back from it before the um, salt stack custom um, resource will run. And this is where we wait. Uh, for, for those who don't know or use CloudFormation, a, a nice uh, command line feature is this uh, CloudFormation deploy. Instead of create stack, basically it allows you to synchronously see the creation of your stack, that way you don't have to create it, and then go and create a query command for it. You can just basically, once the, uh, once the command returns here, you know it's done with the creation. And there is my CloudFormation backend and front end, and there is my instance in there that has the IP address of my EC2 instance. Now, the next thing I need to, what, what, but what happens now when I need to delete this stack? Um, we have a cleanup process, so. I'll now delete the stack I just created. And almost immediately it disappears through the SALT API. So you can't do this, so this is using the HA proxy uh, formula, the one of the two common ones, I forget where I grabbed it from, but you can't just use any, um, formula for this, you have to modify it a little bit um, to understand that it might be in a create, update, or delete scenario. So, but if you do that, if you go through your states and basically uh, modify them to um, behave differently in these scenarios, you can, you can do something like this with CloudFormation. You might be able to even express your entire infrastructure as CloudFormation um, scripts. So I think that's it for that. Are there any questions for myself or Wes at this point? Perfect, everybody just wants to go home. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. Do you want to go to that ending slide? Yeah.